So this X2 addition to an alkene, it works well for bromine and chlorine. And I want to make a little note here that this doesn't work well for I2, for iodine, or for fluorine. And this has to do with the product that you get for, I for iodine is not stable. And actually, fluorine is super reactive, and th that reaction is actually explosive. So those two are not going to work. Iodine, that works. Product, not stable. Fluorine explosive because it's so reactive. So we're going to be focusing on Br2 and Cl2. And the reason we are, though, is we're trying to make something that's synthetically useful if we're trying to synthesize a compound. Alkyl halides are very useful. So let's dive in and look at the products of these two reactions. We have an alkene and Br2. What's going to happen is that the two bromines here are going to add anti to each other. So we're going to have a bromine coming forward and towards us and dashed going back. This orientation of anti is what we will be seeing. So this is anti-addition. And we can actually get the other enantiomer of this one as well. So the product here will be racemic. And we'll walk through the mechanism. Now you can also do this with chlorine. And you'd imagine the same kind of products here where we would have a chlorine coming forward as well as back. These two are opposite of each other and we would also get this racemic product. Solvents that you can use. The key here is that we want to use something that's not nucleophilic. And these solvents also have to be able to dissolve our alkene and our halide, all right? So our diatomic molecule here. So solvents that work well, the ones that I have here are dichloromethane. So dichloromethane, you can use chloroform, like I have in the chlorine example. You can also use like diethyl ether, or here's another ether. This is tetrahydrofuran. THF is typically considered here for the solvent. You can get away with hexane as well. And so these solvents are non-nucleophilic and it's very important and we'll learn a reaction as to why this is so important later on. Let's walk through the mechanism of this reaction. So when we do this reaction, we're actually forming a really cool intermediate. It's called a bromonium ion. And so the way that this forms is we will use our alkene and we'll attack our bromine. Okay, we're gonna kick out our leaving group but this concerted reaction also then kicks back. Now this looks really odd. We have three arrows here and electrons are going everywhere. But if we follow what happened here, I'm gonna draw this uh, second arrow here in this red. That's where our leaving group is leaving. And I wanna show you what happens here in this first step. So we end up getting this odd looking bromonium ion. plus we have Br that was kicked out. The way that I kind of like to look at it is this first arrow here is forming that first carbon bromine bond. And then the second arrow is when the bromine lone pair here, this bromine lone pair comes back and attacks this other side of our alkene, all right? So this is from that third arrow. Now, the order of the arrows you draw them is you won't be able to tell that when you're drawing the mechanism, but I kind of like to think of it this way. So now what's going to happen is we're going to have that Br- minus that was kicked out. We're going to have that act as a nucleophile. And then it's going to kick up our leaving group, this bromonium cation here, this bromonium ion. It's essentially our leaving group. Now, when this bromide ion attacks, it's going to be attacking opposite of the leaving group. The leaving group here is wedged and it's on top. Okay, it's on top. So when the bromide ion comes in and attacks, it's going to be attacking from the bottom. This is where we end up getting that anti configuration. This bromine was the one that was there. And let's draw the one that attacks in red here so we can really see that this is opposite. It's bromonium ion. 
Let's go and redraw this as if the bromine were to attack the other side. Both of the sides of this bromonium ion are feasible for attack here. So we can draw our bromide attacking on this other side here. Kick out our leaving group. And this is where we end up getting that racemic mixture, where on this top example, we have two R's here, and both of our stereo centers here in the bottom are S's. And so both of the stereo centers have switched, and so we have these enantiomers. Now you could also imagine the bromium ion could be formed on the bottom and you could walk through that exercise and see that you still get the same two products here, all right? Now the key here that I really want to ask is why does this bromonium ion even form? Okay, you might be thinking to yourself, what if we just formed a carbocation? So I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take this bromonium ion here. And let's look at this reaction in a little more depth. So we can kind of understand this intermediate of why it's even forming. So our first step of our reaction is forming this bromonium ion and we can redraw the arrows here. We have attack of the alkene kicking out our leaving group and it kind of bites back to make this bromonium ion. If we think about the lone pairs we have on the bromine, we made a new bond with the carbon, right? But then one of the lone pairs was used to attack the other side of the alkene. So we've got these two lone pairs here. Now in our head, we might be thinking, why can't we actually just open this up and draw a carbocation? Why doesn't, why doesn't this form? And the way that we could think about this is why can't we just take the alkene attack our bromine and kick out our BR. Now, this is similar to when we talked about that HBr addition, right? When we take our alkene, we can attack here this hydrogen and kick out Br minus, right? This is really similar. And in this case, we were making same kind of carbocation where we were adding the hydrogen on one of the sides of our alkene. So in our heads, we're like, why does this bromonium ion even form, okay? Now it must form in order for us to get this anti-configuration. When we make this bromonium ion, one of the sides is blocked from further attack from the bromine, okay? The bromine here will always, the second bromine here in red is always coming opposite of our bromonium ion. So it's blocking that side. If we made, if we made a carbocation, like I have here in red, you could imagine that the bromine that we kicked out, so we have this Br minus that was kicked out, could add on either side of this carbocation, okay, to where if it was adding on the top or the bottom, we would end up getting two products. So if on this top one, we added it on the top, it would be on the same side as our original addition of bromine. If we added it on the bottom, we would see this anti addition. The problem with this is we don't see any syn addition when we look at the products of this reaction. And so that makes us look at the mechanism and understand, well, why can't I get sin? And that's this bromonium ion that we're talking about here. Now, one of the reasons why this is formed and we do not, so does not form. Now, one of the reasons why this bromonium ion is so great is because it has, every atom has a full octet. And that's one of the main reasons why it forms and we don't just get this full on carbocation. And the second reason is we don't observe any of the syn product.
So it cannot be going through a full-on carbocation. So let's write this out. So the mechanism does not I'm going to write a full carbocation. This bromonium ion is withdrawing uh, electron density, and we do know that these are partially positive because they are getting attacked, although a full-on carbocation does not form like I have here. Why don't we go through a practice problem together to solidify this idea? What if you were given the product from this reaction? So here I have Br2 in the presence of dichloromethane. And I see here that the bromines are on the same side, right? They're both showing, uh, coming towards us in this wedge. Well, one of the things with these linear alkanes is we can rotate them. So what I would do in this case, if you're given the product, we need to figure out what does this alkene look like? We know it's coming from an alkene, so we just need to figure out what kind of alkene. What I would do is I would rotate this to put the two bromines here opposite of each other. And so I'd actually draw that first, and I would put them flat on the piece of paper. I know these are anti. This reaction will add these two anti. So I'm gonna rotate my product to make them anti. Okay, cool, I have the two bromines anti. And I'm just going to count out my carbons because I just think it's so easy to miss them. Four, five, six. Okay, so this is carbon four and five. Now I need to figure out where everything else goes on this configuration where the bromines are anti. So when we're rotating this, we see here that we need to take this bromine and push it back into the paper because it's coming towards us. So if we push this back, then this methyl that's here is going to be popping out forward. Okay, and then on the left side of this molecule, we have another bromine coming forward. We're going to push it back into the paper. And that means that this alkyl chain is now coming forward as well. Now, both of the alkyl chains are coming towards us. All right. And when we think about the alkene that was necessary, that means that both of the alkyl groups on the alkene were on the same side, same side means that we have a Z alkene. So we started with a Z alkene in order to get this product. Now you could check your work by starting with the Z alkene to see if you form this product. You could keep it simple and say, well, the bromine's going to add above and it's also going to add below. Now we can take this molecule and rotate it to make sure that we have the product that we have here on the right. So I'm going to take this end here and rotate it. I'm going to draw in my hydrogen here. It'll make it a little easier for me to see. I'm taking this whole side and I'm rotating it. You might want to build a model kit as you're working on this. The methyl here, I need to shift it down and in the line of the paper. So I'm going to rotate this. So this is gonna be my backbone. I didn't touch this side, BR. And when I take these two groups and rotate them up, the hydrogen will be back and the bromine will be coming forward. Let's look at a model kit to solidify this um, understanding that we do start from the Z alkene. Here we have our, um, our alkyl chain here with our two bromines. We've got the bromine coming forward, okay? It's right there on my eyeball. And then we have our bromine um, coming down, but also still coming forward. If I rotate these so they're anti of each other, okay, I'm gonna rotate it this way. Notice what's happening now to the, meth the alkyl groups. Now they're coming towards you. So I'm gonna rotate that back, and that way we can see it, okay? So everything's kind of in line, you see that? Okay, bromines are coming forward, one is coming down forward, one's up forward. I'm gonna rotate this anti, okay, so now these this bromine, carbon, carbon, bromine are now on a line, just like we have on our slide. And check this out. Both of the alkyl groups are coming forward, okay? This is where that cis alkene is coming from. Both of the alkyl groups are on the same side. So that's one of the ways that you can take this knowledge of anti 
rotate your product into having both of the bromines anti and just see where those alkyl groups are placed. If they're on the same side, it must have come from a Z alkene. All right, that is it for this video about X2 addition to alkenes, and I will see you in the next video.